Hi, welcome everyone. This is Live TV. My name is Tim Wigan. I am in the Avalon Foundation, and we're uh, um, creating, so you're watching the advent of a new series uh, uh, based on art. In this uh, case, it's plein air art. It's, it's conversation, uh, coffee and conversations. Um, we are going to talk with three artists who painted yesterday about their paintings and get into the subjects of, of plein air uh, painting uh, in general. Because Easton, over the last 15 years, has created, uh, has become the most prestigious plein air event in the country. And um, so what we're going to do is, again, talk to these painters about some of their techniques and tricks and tips and that sort of thing. And uh, then we're going to take a short break uh, for a word from our sponsor, underwriter, PNC Wealth Management. And again, I want to say uh, just what a special sponsor um, they have been. We have Dan Winsky here from PNC right now. And Dan, I really want to uh, extend a great thanks from, on behalf of the Avalon Foundation for searching out events like this and uh, underwriting them uh, through, you know, through your organization. Well, thanks so much, Aaron. We're so excited to be a sponsor of Plan Air, um, PNC, PNC Wealth Management here in Easton and the Eastern Shore. Uh, supports the arts quite a bit. Um, we, in fact, other than sponsoring this, we sponsor the Stoltz Listening Room here at the Avalon. And uh, from Plan Air, we've done the Cambridge Plan Air uh, sponsorship as well. We're just excited to be here and kind of learn more about the artists. Well, sure. thank again, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think PNC well said, uh, "What is your? It's committed to your." There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tag that we run there, and it's, they're very committed to your success. So please consider PNC Wealth Management. Um, Dan is going to sit on the couch with us. You're welcome to ask any questions as we get going Thanks. through if something hits you. Uh, so what we're going to try to do is make sure that anybody who is watching online or in the room, if there's any term that might be uh, beyond you, you know, something you don't understand, I'm going to make sure that all the terms are clear for everyone to understand. And also, I'm going to make sure that the questions are heard from the audience. Uh, so that you know, people online can can hear them. Jessica is over here running the um, Voice from the Sky. She'll be taking your Facebook questions. We're streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. There is a 30 second delay uh, if you're on Facebook and you ask a question. So give us a couple, uh, maybe a minute to to get that question in. And um, uh, Rise Up Coffee is here. We're doing one more of these tomorrow. And uh, Rise Up Coffee is here. Um, you might hear them cooking. You know, creating a smoothie or grinding some coffee beans in the background. Uh, we definitely appreciate the beloved Rise Up Coffee. And uh, having said that, let's go ahead and start the conversation. We are with uh, uh, um, Susan Lynn, Tracy Fregoli, and Paul Bacham. Um, thank you guys very much for coming. Just want to start with a brief introduction real quick. If you could say, uh, reintroduce yourself, say who you are and where you're from. Uh, Susan Lynn, I'm from Rockport, Massachusetts. Uh, Happy to be back here, although it is a shock to my system to come to this heat. It was in the upper 70s in Rockport when I was. Good news, it's getting hotter. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tracy Fergoli. I'm from Peoria, Illinois. Um, super honored to come back and see all the familiar faces. Oh my gosh, hi, you guys. <laughs> Very Thanks, Tracy, for coming back. Thank you. And I'm Paul Basham. I'm from New York, but I live in New Jersey. <laughs> it's Paul Basham. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so, uh, I've been saying Bachum for 10 years. Just don't call me Susan Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're going to go to the, uh, the paintings now, Nick. Um, we're going to talk about, there are uh, five panels here. The first two, the first, first panel contains agricultural paintings. This is for the audience's view. The second panel contains agricultural paintings, which were... Uh, saved, bought last year for the agricultural initiative that the Avalon is doing over the next three years. The next three panels are the ones we're talking about. And so the one that has three paintings on it, those are Paul's paintings. Paul, can you talk about those paintings just a little bit? Uh, where, you know, where were you? What, what, what was, uh, I don't know, maybe your favorite of those three? Yeah, um, my favorite is the top one, is the, the, the latest one. It's the one that I did yesterday. It's uh, out on Harrison Street. Uh, underneath, uh, thanks to Shearer the jeweler for letting me set up under their awning. Um, it was, um, I was sweating to death before I even started just from setting up. The two underneath are actually from last year. Um, the, the second one down is right outside the entrance of Triple Creek, the winery. And the bottom one was a private property. I don't remember 
exactly where that was, but it was a nice private property looking out on the water. So, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I think, uh, Susan, yours are next. Uh, yeah, the top one is at the uh, Talbot Historical Society's Garden, which uh, was one of my favorite places to paint when I was in the competition. So I had to go back there, and it's a beautiful shady spot. Uh, painted there yesterday, and I actually went on and painted Monday afternoon, which is the lower painting. Uh, that's um, Christchurch. And how long did those p paintings take you, uh, uh, Susan? Um, about... Two and a half. Two and a half. Paul, hours, how long does it take you? Uh, you two hours. Two hours? Yeah. Tracy, you want to talk about yours there? The oh, one? sure. My small, little, lonely one over there. Oh, it's lovely. Um, I, I, this, this is outside Mason's, and it's so amazing that I, have, I think I haven't been here for 10 years. It's amazing that a lot of the same businesses are still in business. Here, yeah, right. I was like, wow, that gallery is still open. That so Masons was here from a long time ago, I believe, right? Yes, yes, yes I'm correct. not yes. saying it wrong. Um, my memory, you know, and I just picked, um, okay, so I'm saying to myself, this is your first one of the day, it's going to be small, it's going to be a warm up, <laughs> you're just going to get it done and get out. <laughs> and so I look down the street, I'm and you, I'm picking the spot based on how shady it is and if there's a breeze. So that's why I'm right there in front of Mason's, other than it's beautiful. And I'm looking down the street and there's guys working on a house, I'm like, oh, and there's a cat tractor, I'm like, oh, I want to do that. And I'm like, well, that's not simple. So I say, no, pick something simple. So I just did their flower baskets. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. How long, and how long did that take? Okay, so that should have taken me two, two and a half hours, right? <laughs> but it didn't. It took me longer. Um, I would say a good three, right? Um, so then I went to the Historical Society and, oh. Yeah. And the trees were doing this, like all these flowering trees, and there was distance. And I'm like, oh, I'm not leaving anything on the table. I'm getting my big canvas out, and it's halfway done. Oh, it's halfway done. <laughs> so I'm going to go back today and finish it. Well, and that, and that will be on the, you'll put that up I on the I hope so. I hope sure, there's room. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll bring uh, it. Um, how big is big? Yeah. How big is big? For me, I mean, yeah, 12 by 24. 12 by 24. That's big for me. Okay. Um, now, again, people are watching online, and audience questions, if anyone has any questions in the audience, you're free to uh, ask those as well. Jess will come around uh, to you with the microphone. I wondered if you could talk, and you can take this over, anybody can start off this, any of your technique in this, and yesterday I said uh, tricks, but Elaine Bassa actually said it's not tricks, it's tips. Could you offer any? <laughs> I like tricks. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> so, magic show. <laughs> could you talk about these? I know that you've got a page. Well, you can talk about this yourself, but they talk about painting shapes and they talk about getting the shadows first. But Paul, could you talk about your painting a little bit and maybe, you know, maybe the top one there? If that was the one you did, you did yesterday. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, I like to do I like to do these downtown things. Um, there's a vibrancy to it that I really like. Um, people coming and going, moving gets a little uh, a, a little interest into it. It's they're interesting subjects because the way, especially yesterday, the way the light was coming. You know, it's bane of all of us is how the light changes during the day. But because I paint downtown, I've got a lot of upright vertical buildings and things like that, and the light changes very quickly on those. Uh, vertical subjects. So um, I basically concentrated a lot on the building across the street, the way the light was hitting the white trim around the windows and things like that. But it, you can notice in the painting, you might be able to see there's the, the line of the shadow of the buildings is on the street. And the line underneath the awning in particular of the built the brick building, um, the shadow that was underneath there. As the sun gets higher, those shadows all get longer and the shadow on the street moves this way. So um, you kind of have to be constantly aware of how that's changing, which is another reason that I try to do these very, very quickly. Um, I, my technique is, I think of it more as sketching with, uh, with oil paint now than, than I used to. So that's the kind of the looseness there. And then I had this woman walk by wearing pink pants, and I said, there you go. Just, <laughs> that, that just did it for me right there. So she went in. 
That's excellent. I do I end up with a lot of people saying, did you get me in the painting? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Susan, you want to talk about your, any tips you might have on, on creating something like those uh, two paintings? Uh, well, as Paul said, it's all about the light, and we're always watching what the light's going to do. Um, working with watercolor, you can't really undo what you've done mm -hmm. once you put it down. Yeah. So generally, when I start a painting, the first thing I do is to try and block in the shadows and get that established first so I know that's what I want to capture. That's my, That visually is going to change, but I've got it on there where I want it to be right from the get-go. So then I work from there. You know, watercolors, you generally work light to dark, so putting in the shadows first is a little, uh, you know, antithetical to how you normally work, but it, if I just put them in lightly, I have it established, and that helps me sort of maintain my idea throughout the painting. Put it in the shadows first. Tracy, yeah, do you have yeah. anything to offer? Any kinds of tips? <laughs> do I have anything tips? to offer? Um, <laughs> I'm sure you have a plain <laughs> offer. <laughs> okay, so that threw me. Um, gosh, I, I, I mean, I think it, you guys said it. Uh, there's a lot. But, um, like, for this particular painting, let's just say, um, there was clapboard from, um, from the it was a porch and then you've got your flower basket so there's clapboard so there's lines there's lots of lines going away right in this v kind of thing and that could easily be super duper extract distracting behind those flower baskets and my my center of interest is not the clapboard so while that was in front of me and it would describe <coughs> masons um i just chose for the painting to be more strong to go abstract in the back so there's these abstract kind of amorphous yeah. shapes behind there so you don't know is there, are there shops behind there are there you know what is happening there and most of the artists that came and talked to me um, they said well, I really love this air, this passage right here you know because really painting is an abstract process it, it, it in the, we put the shapes together to make them so that the brain says oh that's a flower basket or oh that's a you know fence or whatever um, but really it's all just a collection of abstract shapes so I chose to eliminate things that I thought would be distracting which is kind of hard for a planar painter in a way it, it, I know it is for me I have to train myself which is probably why it takes so long for me to paint paintings now is because I'm inventing these abstract shapes behind there and sometimes they don't work and you have to repaint them and change them and maybe I'll add something in behind or wherever that needs to be taken out later I realize it doesn't work for the painting so I guess that would be my trick. You know, just because it's in your scene doesn't mean you have to paint it. Right. Well, that, I, I'm looking at here. It's hard. It's very hard to see what's going on with those paintings from this angle. So looking here, uh, it's very, it's beautiful in the background what you did there. And I'm sure if you're watching on the television or, or on Facebook or on YouTube, you can see that uh, that sort of abstract thing you made up in the background. Um, I want to ask this question uh, real quick. Uh, you people, you painters, you, you look at light so much different than the average person going to work each day. I mean, are you lovers of light? I, I was just, I've been watching the videos going back and critiquing, like, my, I mean, and everybody just keeps talking about light and light. And it's like, I mean, of course, for the lay person like myself, you'll, you'll, we'll see a, a sun coming through, you know, trees occasionally and say, oh, that would be a lovely painting. But you guys see the world that way all the time. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, I think that um, trained artists, um, we see the same thing that everybody else sees, but we just, we see it differently. I think that uh, artists, because they're trained, tend to understand. I know for, in my case that um, I would say that my teachers taught me how to understand what it was that I was looking at. So I can, it, the waving the arm around part is the easy part. The most of the painting goes on. <laughs> Uh, upstairs as far as I'm concerned so yeah um, you know and it's it's a collection of everything we're talking a lot about the light but there's light shapes perspective color there's all those things that that we process maybe a little bit differently than other people do but that's that's how I think about it ladies you have anything to add on that I think it's also about just patient observation I mean right. the average person does not stand in one spot and look at one thing for two or three hours in one shot right, right. <laughs> So you, you're trained to really look hard at things and really closely observe 
what the light is doing and how it's changing and what how it affects the colors and where it's bouncing off of one thing to another. So once that's sort of ingrained in your brain, even when you're just casually looking at something, you're you're really looking. Tracy? Yeah, I think it's because because the light is so fleeting, you do have to train yourself to be a careful observer and a very fast careful observer. So you, you that muscle is active almost all the time. And sometimes, you know, like you're going over a bridge and you see a beautiful, you know, sunset or whatever, and you're like, <laughs> um, we can be very yeah, bad drivers. <laughs> yeah, because we're painting paintings as we drive. That's right. What, yeah, I yeah. would say that when, when my eyes are open, I'm painting. That's that's how I think of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have a question, I think, from Facebook. Yeah, I've got a question from my friend Annette Hansen, who's writing to us today on Facebook, and she says, can you speak to how you choose to paint a scene? And I think, Tracy, you already sort of did that with saying, you know, you're looking for something simple and shady, and um, but how do you guys choose what it is that you want to go paint? Yeah, I call it the ooh factor. Um, if I'm walking along, like Tim just said, that everybody will every now and then say, you know, the light coming through the trees or something like that. And I think for a lot of us, you're walking along, and if I see something and I go, ooh, that's <laughs> that's what I call the ooh factor. That's what usually makes me want to do it. Yeah, yeah. or you do a little gas. Yeah. Like, oh, right. Yeah. Look at what the light exactly. is doing. Does that happen to you all day? Yeah. <laughs> Do you walk around like that all day? Ooh. ooh. <laughs> some, some, some days, some days, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, uh, Dan, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Hop in if you if you if you uh, something hits you. I I want to go. Well, thanks for the qu question, Annette. I want to ask something. We've been talking over the last two days, and we constantly hear about uh, you know you have to learn to draw. You've got to learn to draw. You've got to learn to draw. Then, but that's also coupled with put in the shapes. Put in the shapes first, put in the shapes first. Do you have to learn to draw shapes? Or uh, that's kind of where my question leads. Is it you have just... to learn to see shapes. Uh, people, when they draw, tend to outline things. That's sort of our natural inclination, but lines don't really exist out there in nature. It's shapes and how the light is, is hitting things. So learning to draw when we say that you need to understand perspective you need to you know make a building look like a building going back into space you need to understand how to compose a painting how to make your eye move around there those are the drawing elements once you do that you need to learn how uh, the shapes form the whole scene right. so working on those big shapes keeps you from getting swallowed up in you know, doing every little detail and not creating any kind of depth or movement out of your piece. Right. Paul, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think Susan said that very well. I, it, that's kind of the, the point that I was uh, maybe not making before, is that to me it's it's about, you know, I uh, because of my training and because of the way I was, I was taught, I understand why things look the way they do. I understand why it's the shape it is, why it's the value it is, why it's the color it is, where the reflected light's coming from. Um, the longer you do it, that stuff, you're... You're kind of like a computer. It's just data that comes in, and you just process it and put it on the panel. So, again, the, to, not to repeat myself, but the, this this part of it is the easy part. It's it's understanding why it looks the way it does. That's critical. That's what I feel like I run into a lot of time with students. They don't have that understanding, and that's what they need to learn how to do. Tracy, I think that um, when I think of shapes, um, they're the, like we talked about the light. Well, it's really value how light or dark a shape is. So a shape is not, say, the back of a chair. A shape is the light hitting the back of the chair. Like, like, does it bisect the chair? Um, and the, like, let's say light was hitting the back of a chair and it was making a pattern, right? From a window, let's just say. So that would be a shape of the light hitting it. And then a different shape would be the shadow part hitting it. Um, so I guess that, that's what I think. I think of shapes as puzzle pieces that I draw out with charcoal, vine charcoal, so I can move them around if I need to um, first before I do my painting. Because in a way, I'm, I'm, then I'm, I'm starting the painting by, OK, that shape does this, and that shape does that. And I can then just kind of make sure that I have things in the right place. So okay. that's drawing to me. It's drawing shapes. OK. And uh, we're going to take a couple, we'll do a couple more questions, and then we'll take a quick break here. Um, uh, what is the relationship uh, between your hand and the end of the brush? <laughs> about uh, 
eight, nine inches. Right? <laughs> well, right, right. Um, is that not what you meant? Oh, well, I, you know, I just, for, you know, for the, for the dancer, it's his feet, and for, you know, the piano player, it's their fingers, and, you know, I just started, uh, again, going back through the interviews and looking back over, it just sort of, uh, it hit me, something that feels complicated to me is, I feel like I could take, say, you know, my fingers and even make a shape closer than taking the brush and, you know, getting it, uh, you know, correct or, or yeah. what, what I felt was appealing. So how long did it take you to get used to the, the, the brain to the tip of the brush? I think you're always getting used to it. I mean, if you look at any painter out there, there's usually a mound of brushes. We all have this huge array, and I know with me, there's certain brushes I pick for certain things, but there's like two or three that I use constantly that are always in my hands. Um, they become sort of an extension of your hand. Once you use it over and over, you have things that it, you're familiar with how that brush feels, how it plays, how it distributes the paint. Right. Paul? Yeah, I, the least important thing in my gear is, is the brush. It really is just, uh, it's just the method of getting the paint on there. So again, it's, it, I keep repeating myself, but it's what goes on up here that, that comes out in the brush. Sometimes your finger is, is the best brush Don DeMar says best brush in the box is your finger sometimes. So. Tracy? Well, I, I do think that that's a really great question, first of all. Oh, I thanks. love that question. I got one good question. <laughs> I, mean, I, I love the whole, the whole process of, like, analyzing what does my brain do when I'm painting. I love that process of analyzing that because if I can get the brain to be more efficient and connect to the hand and what goes on the canvas and then we, like... <clears throat> We go, we roll with it. Um, that I'm always thinking about that. Um, so I, I would say all that stuff that you guys said, but then I would also say once it becomes an extension, once you understand exactly what that particular brush does, and it's one of your favorites for doing X, um, then it fails you because it wears out it stops doing what it was doing before and um that's kind of like ah oh. or let's the say brush you, wears out yes <laughs> so it's like that you yeah exact so it's like you but had this guy and it was working else. for you yeah maybe it starts something sometimes. else and sometimes you like it um and so then you have to buy new ones and break them in um but I, I think another point, like when it comes to the brain and you painting, I mean, it's so important, you guys, analyze what your brain is doing because always every single brush stroke should have a purpose. No stupid strokes. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> and I tell my students that. No stupid strokes. And when I say stupid strokes, that means it's a stroke that doesn't have a purpose. If it's not serving a purpose, it's going to ruin your painting. Um, and you're probably going to do it over and over again because you don't know what else to do. So when you find yourself doing that, stop and say oh that was a that's i got into stupid stroke plan um because you got to get that stupid brain back plan. on track get that brain engaged for every single stroke well just before we take break out uh, uh you know sort of add to that there was several years ago there was a judge who was doing the, the children he was judging the children's drawings and i you know he went and he picked this one there was a beautiful drawing of the, the, the canopies that used to be over, or over, at, over at Mason's. And then there was this other child who did a fence with a house, and, and that child won. It was very sort of, you know, uh, basic, I guess is what you would say. And I went and I asked the judge, and he said, I said, why did you pick that one versus this gorgeous thing that looked like this flower? And he said, well, if you look at this child who did this, there's, they never erased anything. Every line was... They never went back over anything. They just did the whole thing in one thing, and, and that, that's kind of stuck to me. So, um, again, we are here with uh, Susan Lynn and Tracy Fagoli and Paul Basham, along with uh, Dan uh, Winsky from PNC Wealth Management. We're going to take a quick break real quick, and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, more things plein air in general. And I have a, pri a surprise for Tracy Fagoli that she does not know about, which should surprise her. We'll be right back in nice. just one second. <laughs> wow.
Ooh la la, wow, fabulous. Now you have forgotten that I have to take Colleen at quarter to four for her blood work. Okay. So I should be back by five. Okay. But I just told Susie if I, I might be. We're back with Coffee and Conversations here in the Avalon Theater. I'm with Susan Lynn, Trace Rigoli, and Paul Basham. And uh, we are underwritten and sponsored by PNC Wealth Management. Dan Winsky has left. His phone was blowing up. He's got to get back to work. But, Dan, thank you for sticking by, and we'll see someone from PNC Wealth Management here tomorrow. Again, Rise Up Coffee is in the house, and we'll do one more of these tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock. I should mention today, if you are watching and are in the area, that... Charlie Hunter and guests will be doing a uh, talk at 1 o'clock today. They did a, uh, it's called En Train Air, and they are in train air. I guess you can say it that way with the word train being in it. They traveled halfway across the country um, to do sort of an expose of painting and the small towns that the railroads go through uh, this past summer. And they will be talking about that today at 1 o'clock inside the Avalon. We're taking your questions on Facebook and maybe YouTube Live through Jessica Bellis over there. And she will be asking any questions. Please write them in. Audience, again, please, if you have any questions. I know it could be a little nerve-wracking, but yesterday the audience really got into it and asked a lot of questions. So please, if you have anything, just raise your hand. Um, so I uh, want to talk. We, we did get a question written in last, last, last night from little Annie Young from Seattle. And she wanted to know, because we've basically asked this question straightforward, what is it about Plein Air Easton being the most prestigious that you know, makes it the most prestigious event. But her question was a little bit more specific. And, she, you know, I know you guys are not in it this year, but you have been in it several times. And um, what is it, is there a favorite event that happens here beyond, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna limit it. Is there a favorite event that happens here? Or is it just the experience of Plein Air Easton in general as a whole thing that makes it so, sort of uh, the, the prestigious event that it is? Uh, I, I think it's the whole package. Uh, it's so beautifully run, and uh, the whole uh, concept of the thing is to make it work for the artists. They, uh, you know, they feed you every chance they get. They uh, adapt to whatever schedules they recognize that this is hugely demanding for the artists to be out there in the heat, you know, sometimes 10 or 12 hours a day painting their guts out to try and get an entire body of work for a week and they they put it on right and the event at the end is done perfectly you know everything's well lit there's a big show it's you know beautifully done and they bring bring an audience in to see your work which is one of the most rewarding things as an artist to actually have it appreciated and seen Paul, do you have a favorite event, or is it just the experience? I was uh, listening to Susan and agreeing with everything she said. I think the whole thing is just so fantastically run. Um, I've been here a, a, a long time, um, and um, it, it, every every part of it is just uh, every detail. Um, Avalon, everybody at Avalon does such a great job taking care of us, really, for the whole week. Um, I particularly enjoy Friday night. I, that's uh, the kind of the culmination of the week, seeing all those red dots explode on the wall. Um, and I do enjoy the quick draw. Yeah. Tracy? Um, well, I was here, I think, the second through the fifth or something like that. Um, and so I was here kind of when they were sort of in their in their babyhood. And, and I could tell um, that they set out to actually be what they are today. This is what they start from the get-go. They had a plan. And they were sticking to that plan, and they expanded that plan. And... Um, they made it what it is, and you could see the excitement, you could see the investment that they had in it. And it wasn't just, oh, this is another event we put on. I mean, which it, it is, I'm sure, just another event they put on, because there's all kinds of events around here that are great. But it, it I mean, you could just tell the amount of detail and thought and, you know, yes, taking care of the artists, yes, and having the engagement, even this right now, we're like live on Facebook. I mean, I've never been live on Facebook. <laughs> I shouldn't admit that. But I mean, you know, they're keeping up with the times and everything. So um, uh, yeah, you could tell from the beginning that they 
had a goal and they they have achieved it and congratulations to you guys i'm yeah. i'm just you know she's yes yeah, yeah. right <laughs> Tracy is pointing off camera to uh, Jess Bellis and Al Bond, who are spearhead this event for the last 14 or 15 years. And uh, Nancy Tanker said they also want to make sure that, because uh, she was kind of the um, impetus to, to get it all going. Um, I want to go back, Tracy, just real quick. Uh, when you got here years ago, the, the, I, I thought you were here the first year. Maybe it was the second year. Yeah. Um, I didn't under, you know, I've been involved with Plein Air for all 15 years. When it first started happening, it was the very first thing they were, we didn't even know really what it was, uh, you know, like, like many people uh, didn't at the time. And they said, Tim, go cover this for the Avalon and you're going to do some press for it and find out exactly what it is. So I got involved and when it happened, I didn't know what it was. And, you know, then you came and I saw one of your paintings, and it was just loaded down. It was thick with oil paint on it, incredibly thick. And I was like, oh, now I see what this can really be. And, you know, I wanted to purchase it. I wanted to, to, uh, to um, buy it. And I never forgot you. And then you didn't come back for a long time. And so that was my surprise from the thing. It was like that was a huge moment for me. In oh. terms of understanding all this and understanding art and realizing how lucky I am to be able to do this, so um, uh, um, uh, going off of that, do, does having less lines in paintings and less paint brush marks in paintings does that make them more impressive or? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's. Um of each individual artist. I mean, uh, you know, you, there's 58 artists here. You can see 58 different ways of going about it, ways of doing it, and, and, and 58 different uh, finished products. You know, everybody does and thinks about it differently. Some people paint thin, some people paint thick. Um, it, it's, it, that's what's another great thing about this. I remember my first year here being just walking in and seeing all the stuff on the wall in, at, at the academy and just being blown away by it. Um, not only the, the quality of the work, but just the diversity of style and approach and, and technique that you see, which to me is one of the really fun things about, you know, uh, coming here and seeing how differently everybody works. You know, Charlie with his squeegee paintings and, you know, everybody is, is just totally different. And that's what's exciting for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I remember distinctly walking into the opening of Easton the first time seeing the work and being struck by how each person had such a unique voice that was just mind-blowing to me i mean even as a painter to see such distinctive takes on the same subject matter well, tracy you had a sort of a, hmm. when i asked the question yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what is what have you went well, I think your question had to do with, like, are there fewer lines and fewer brush strokes and that's better? Was well, yeah, is that, well, it just, uh, you, you know, uh, there was a, somebody remarked yesterday that they had actually studied how to not make brush strokes, but she didn't want to go that way. Mm, you yeah, know, that sort of like thing. Like a surfaceless kind of painting. Yes. Um, yeah, so here's the thing. In a way, you have to find your style. So you have to it, maybe experiment with super thick paint, maybe experiment with um, a surfaceless kind of painting. Um, I think that we, in uh, okay, what I've my, my let me just talk from my own experience. Um, in the plein air world, in a way, there's a way of painting, or or even maybe in just like I, I don't know certain circles that that might value certain things over other things. And then, so I, when I was first starting and like, I guess, I know the year I he was here, Scott Burdick was the judge because I adore Scott Burdick. Thick painting, great drawing, um, great color, et cetera, et cetera. So that was my first year and I actually got two awards from Scott Burdick. So is there anything else I need to do in my life? Well, I was just a baby at the time in the plein air. I mean, this is my first plein air festival was that that particular one I and it was like Disneyland for, for for artists by the way I just want to say that um, and so I had this conception of what it is a painting should be like so then when I experienced 
painters that didn't paint like that, I dismissed it to my peril, I think. Um, so my, I think you're better off coming to an event like this and being blown away by all the different styles and being and experiencing that rather than valuing something over something else. Realize that that person has their own muse. They have their own brain brush connection. And isn't it awesome that Charlie, his brush sometimes is a squeegee, you know what I mean? Um, so I guess in a way that's advice. When you're first starting out, realize there's all kinds of ways and legitimate ways to paint. It doesn't just have to be this one kind of path. Uh, and I, I remember the first time I walked into a, uh, what Tracy said reminded me too that um, there's 58 of the best plein air painters in the country here any one year. And when you walk into that room for the first time and see those paintings on the yeah. wall by those people, it is an adult dose. You, uh, yes. yeah. you really, you got to pick up your game when you see the stuff yeah. that's on the wall in that room. You really do. Um, I'm always amazed by, still am every year, just amazed by the quality of the work that's here and, and the. Uh, the 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 quality of the, the the artists and the people that are here and you know i'm fans of a lot of these people so it's a treat to get to see their work every year when i come down once again we're with uh, paul bosch um, susan lynn and trace fregoli at coffee and conversations inside the avalon theater if you're just joining us um uh jess you have a question yeah audience? you want to take a question hi everyone that's just wonderful this is such a great opportunity and a privilege for us that you're here um, I have a question a little off um, what we're talking about. It has to do with you personally and your development as a painter. And what I hear all the time when people are walking around looking at our painters is they say, you have so much talent. Mm -hmm. I wish I had that talent, and I don't. Um, there's an implication that somehow or other being a good painter is something to do with being born with this talent. Right when in fact um, I've always perceived that there is a lot of hard work involved and it isn't just that you were born to be a painter which is sort of what talent is as opposed to um, the fact that you really work hard and I, I would just like you to sort of comment on the balance between that how to what degree is it your talent and to what degree is it the amount of work you put in yeah I, I get in trouble for this all the time it's, it's almost a fight every time I do not believe in the word talent at all. I do not believe in it. I think that if I have a talent, it's that I had the desire to work hard, if, that's, if that could be considered a talent. Um, it's a craft that you learn. Um, if you play, if you've learned to play a musical instrument, I don't think there's any difference. It's you learn the theory, you learn the technique, and you practice it. Um, I, somebody one time, came up to me and I said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a, I'm a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I said to him, I said, so you'll open up somebody's body and do stuff in it, but you don't think you could do this? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, no, I just, I do not believe in the word talent and people yell it all the time about it. And it's just what it is. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's uh, the, per the traditional perceived thing of talent. I, I think maybe it's more, um, mm that we have a passion for this right. and have pursued it relentlessly. Uh, I, you know, we were talking about seeing the light that we're painting in our heads all the time. We're studying all the time. We're learning from each other and from the masters. And I don't know a single good painter out there who isn't working at getting better all the time. So yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I think ahead, Tracy. my perception might be slightly different, although I totally agree um, that it's, there's a ton of hard work, there's a ton of obsession. It's like down to the point of obsession, I think. Um, but I do think that there, all of our brains are different. Um, and I think that's just a fact. My husband is analytical, he works in computers. Um, he can think differently, he has different talents. And I'll throw things at him. I'm like, give me uh, some numbers that go with that. Or, ooh, this is numbers. <laughs> Do this. Um, and, and my brain is, is completely different. Um, and, and it works like an artist's brain. Um, and so I do think that we are wired with different uh, brain um, propensities, let's just say. Um, 
But we also know that the brain is plastic. We know more than ever before that the brain can change, um, which is super duper exciting. Enter training, passion, hard work. And then you, you take that plastic brain that you were given. Um, so s probably, more than likely, if we're up here or we're out there with an easel, we probably have the kind of brain that's an artist's brain. Um, and then you, you add other stuff to that and make that brain work even better and hopefully come out with a, a, a painting that's worthy of a frame. It's wonderful from all three of you. Uh, Jess, you have another question? I'd like to ask the panelists uh, what are some of the uh, pressures and anxieties associated with this event specifically. Oh, what a great question. <laughs> I'll tell you what, there's none this week for me. I know, I know, right? <laughs> We're golden. I know. I'm, I'm going fishing later. I don't know what all you, the rest of you are doing. But, um, yeah, it's. I think, you know, in the competition, when you're one of the competition artists, um, that, you know, you, uh, you know, we're here, to, they make a lot of money here, A, they sell a, a lot of paintings here, and uh, you want to do the best you can, it's, it's, it's part of your income, and so there's, there's that pressure, there's the award pressure, is this going to win an award, is there, you know, uh, I, I know a lot of times I'll be out in the morning and I'll do something I don't like and I'll scrape it off and I'm like, oh no, I'm only going to get one done today kind mm -hmm. of thing, so it, it, it's, it's very, uh, very, I found it very a lot of pressure, which is one reason I didn't submit this year. Just, it's it's for younger people than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the comment you made earlier, Paul, about you walk into that show and realize you have to up your game. The caliber of artists that get into this event yeah. is so high that I, I mean, truly, there's pressure just not to be embarrassed when you hang your work. <laughs> it's. Um, yeah, you have to up your How game. How does that here. manifest itself in the field when you're actually work, doing the work? Mm. Uh, this stinks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think you push yourself harder. You, you really, uh, your critical mind really shifts into gear while you're painting. You're really stepping back and really thinking through your paintings a little more. There's um, a meme I've seen a couple of times on Facebook that really says it well. It's something like, this is great, this isn't very good, this is crap, this is pretty good, this is getting better. It just kind of, it just kind of goes like that all the time right? like when you, while you're working on it, I right. think. That's how it works for me, yeah. It yeah. Is, that is true. There's a whole, there's an ugly stage and, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, to the paintings. Um, I think, okay, so, gosh, it's so, I've, I've t thought about this, this exact question. Um, for for a long time because it's like there's this excitement and bliss and joy and painting and selling and seeing your friends and da 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 and then there's like the whole pressure of awards and selling in a way but that's like almost like a baby pressure you know um, you know you do want to have sellable work right um, but but the awards can really get you because that's going to get you from the ego part. That's going to come in the back door and say, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? Like, cause you, like in my, my experiences, your ego can kill your painting. Um, so you, you have to almost practice a no mind kind of thing. Like, the awards don't matter other than I want to produce excellent work. So that I'll have a group that I can choose the two competition paintings that I want for the awards. That's where you have to go. You have to like say bye bye to your ego, um, but not so much that you lose confidence. Ego and confidence are two different things. Right. Be confident that when you step up to the easel, you have the skills that it takes. You have the experience that it takes to produce a piece of work. And if you don't, you scrape it off. And I think it's important to kind of forget everything that you've done so far every time you step up, step up to the easel. That that painting is just that mm -hmm. painting. And that's your You're in your that moment. moment right yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Plain air painting is an in the moment thing. It yeah. trains you. You don't have a choice. Right. You're in that moment. Jess, do you have a question? Yep, we got one back here and then we got one up there. Okay. Hi. Um, I just um, wanted to kind of go back to the previous question a little bit. Um, cause, um, I wondered if, um, any of you, cause I, I 
I believe in talent. <laughs> um, I appreciated your, your answer, kind of putting the two together. Um, I wanted to ask if any of you um, have, have uh, thought of it as a gift from God, or have you thought when you're, because painting is so meaningful, like there's something deeper there, and um, you know, I, I look at I look at artwork and I just say glory to God, and um, I wonder, I, I hope that you do, I hope that, that you can give thanks to God for that. Um, um, have any of you ever saw it in a spiritual way? Well, my uh, my artist statement is pretty spiritual, but it's pretty open ended. It's like, but because I early on, just the painting process itself feels very spiritual, and if there's any way that I would pray, it would be painting. Um, <laughs> Right. So, Susie, have anything on that? It's very meditative. It's, it yeah. can be very transcendent. Um, and it, for me, less so being in a busy urban area, but if I'm just out in nature, that's you're feeling a, a communion with what's around you. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a, a good place to be when you're painting. Paul? Yeah. Well, uh, not the way I think about it. Not the way you think about it? Yeah. No. Um, Interesting. Uh, well, actually, I want to kind of just, before we get to the next question, just real quick, watching, I believe we just showed Elise Phillips' uh, sped up um, sort of uh, thing that she did, painting that she did in Oxford. And my question when I watched that, because again, I watched these things at night to try to get better at doing this, was like, there was, there, in that, I thought Nick did, did a great job on both those, on Chris's and Elise's. But there was a little bit of romance. It looked kind of, rom the way she was looking at the painting, is this a romantic still for you guys, or is it work? Still, or you, you know, it, it just seems sort of like a romantic style. I mean, the, the way he shot—it could have been Nick. It could have been all Nick's. Day. You know, you're, you're all looking like I'm crazy. I, mean, <laughs> um, I don't know how you think about romance, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, well, I mean, yeah, you have to explain it, it, it because there's a romantic yes, period in art that, history. Yeah, the yeah, style of art in a way. Uh, we'll get back. I'll, I'll mix that question. That, that's, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's more complicated than you thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that there's a, there's a, I, am, I think I, I, I was just teasing. I, I think I understand your question. And I think there is, you know, it's part of uh, why we do what we do. You know, we love to do it. You know, it, it, it makes us feel good. It makes our spirit feel good. It makes our soul feel good. And it's a struggle. It's, a, you know, it's always kind of back and forth about that. I think it's the uh, romance part of it that kind of gets you out there to do it. Mm. And then, uh, then it goes downhill after that. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes work. <laughs> right? Tim, Tim Kelly? <laughs> Do you have a question? I've been involved in all 15 years. I love having you back. I've loved all 15 years. Um, and I see lots of... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I love... Um, the relationships that I've been able to make with all of the artists over all of the years. And I see those relationships amongst yourselves, too. I love watching you come back together, you know, from farther afield. We are a plein air East and festival and competition. And, of course, there is that. But would you speak to the... Yes, you are in competition with one another. You know, you, only one of you can win the grand prize and all the others. But would you speak to the... The more personal side of it, the frame sharing and the, you know, yes, you're competitors, but I see a whole lot of we're all in this together, a lot of support. Would you go into that a little bit? I, from for your me, point it's for me, view? it's like um, it's like a golf game. I don't think that I'm in competition with them. I'm in competition with what's out there. Um, I'm, I, I, all I can do is the best painting that I can do. Um, so I don't see it as competition with the other artists um, as much as competition with myself. So, as, that's okay. the way I think what about it. What about the ego? And, uh, oh, this is, it's, the artist community is a wonderful, tight-knit community right. in the planner world. Um, a lot of us do many events around the country, and we see each other. We cross paths repeatedly, and it's it, a lot of us refer to it as this is our tribe. You know, so there are lifelong friendships that are happening amongst these artists. It's very supportive, and the the competition is, as Paul said, you're competing with yourself. You can only paint as well as you can paint. You're not going to go kick over somebody else's easel mm -hmm. to win a prize. 
That's, that's a good idea. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a rare treat for most artists to have other artists to go yes. paint with. Right. Yes. Your profession, this profession can be very isolating, very, isolating. very yes. solitary. So we're excited to see each other and to go paint together. And yeah, it's, right. it's a fun I thing. I think that, you know, the ego thing, that ego, trust me, everybody gets it. You know, they're like, oh man. Or maybe the, the, you know, judging sometimes can be goofy or whatever. But you know what? That judge saw value in that painting and, and amongst all the others. So, okay, I'm going to go with it. If, and maybe you can find out why that judge picked that one over the others. So I think, okay, so the thing about it is, is that the competition part is actually not real. It's just, it's an illusion. But it's nice. I mean, I'm not saying take it out. Um, <laughs> you know, we love to win awards, right? I mean, sure. it feels yeah, good, yeah. right? Sure. Um, but you also love, you You walk in that that room with the 100 and ever so many paintings, the competition paintings, and a lot of times you know which one's going to win, or at least you know which one's going to win Art's Choice, because it's the one that with the most clarity, and it, it the, it, it's the most, um, it's just the most, and you just know it, and it's not yours. Right. The year Hulot yeah. won, I yeah. think everybody felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. She won the Artist Choice like, Award and the competition. Everyone knew or that was Or the we'll best go up to the one that said, I voted for you. And, you know, maybe they didn't win, but I voted for you. We yeah. love that. Right. right. Do, do you ever think when you're planning your week or your paintings about who the judge is? No, I don't. Try hard not to. Yeah, like when you know him, it's almost worse. Well, yeah. Scott Burton, yeah. right? You're <laughs> well, that, I mean, that was, I worked was, out okay for him. Yeah, yeah, that worked out great. That was like, yay, Scott, I love him. Um, yeah, when you know the judge, it's almost worse. Because then, oh, you know what I hate? Is when you're painting out in the field in the competition, and you're thinking about the judge, and you're thinking about, I wonder if the judge will like this. And I'm like, oh, that's like the worst thing because then the competition is in interrupting that, that, um, that flow, uh, that that connection, that yeah. the process. Well, real quick before we get to this question, real quick, we got another one back here, Jess. Somebody was talking about that yesterday and saying that uh, they actually, you guys can expound upon this. They actually thought that it was kind of good at times when people from the public will come up and talk to them because it would shut off their critical side of their brain and they would just paint while they were talking and weren't really thinking about it and it turned it out it turned out that that would work out really well for them so is that uh, it can be a double-edged sword sometimes you turn off your brain and you're just making marks the mm -hmm. stupid marks because you're talking yeah right. um but um, yeah if you're overthinking something and somebody distracts you then you can kind of turn back to it with a little bit of a fresh eye but are festivals like this good for good for the for the plein air uh movement in general you know oh, by yes. creating the, okay. oh yes oh, yeah, and then absolutely. having the our participation and being available for people to talk to you that's really important and I think that's a special thing for collectors and people who are interested in this to be able to see an artist creating work that's something you don't normally get to see, um, to be able to talk to them about their process and why they do what they do or how they do what they do is is a great introduction for people into the world of, of art. How often outside of painting and competitions do you sell a painting that you created on the exact same day or maybe the next day later? How often does it sit in the studio and you have to wait for a buyer to walk through? Well, that's more common. That's more, yeah. okay. Yeah. Right, right. Um, you have a question back here? Yeah, I'll, I'll pass the microphone. I just wanted to um, thank you guys for being alumni and for coming out and painting yesterday on the street and um, being such great ambassadors for Plenary Easton. And I also want to thank all the alumni who are watching now on Facebook. There are so many of them who are who are tuning in to hear what you have to say. I saw Julie Riker on there and Andre Luciero and um, uh, Paul George was just chiming in. So um, hi to all the alumni out there. We're really grateful for 15 years of wonderful artists. Like I think that the artists are so essential to Plenary Easton's success. So I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for that. The ratings are up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sheila, and I'm new to this world, so I'm so excited I come each year. But I wanted to know how each of you started, what age, and how you started painting. Hmm, good question. Um, I've, I've always drawn, I, I have a photograph of me five years old holding up a drawing, so I've always, I've always liked to do it. 
Um, I went to art school. I was an illustrator for about 30 years. So actually, the plein air thing is somewhat new to me. I'm a trained figure painter is how, what my training was. So that's, um, and I'm going back and doing more of that lately. Yeah. Uh very similar. Uh, early childhood was always drawing and painting. A uh, degree in fine art. Uh, did architectural illustration for a living for about 15 years and then gradually transitioned to uh, fine art. Yeah. Tracy? Oh gosh. Um, okay, so yeah, I, yeah, um, college and all that stuff. But they didn't <laughs> teach you how to paint or draw in oh, college. Right. That's art just school. a starting point. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I also was in, I did metals and small sculpture and jewelry. So, I mean, anyway, so, and I didn't know I wanted to paint in this style. I would never have accepted a representational style of painting when I was a youngster in college. Um, so I had to come to it late because I needed the maturity to recognize the importance and um, this, the importance that, that this kind of painting I don't know how to finish that sentence, um, but the, just just how valid and important this representational painting kind of thing was. And um, so I guess I was in my 30s. I don't even remember. Um, and I'm not going to tell you um, what my age is now. But um, <laughs> so and the I don't know if that ans answers your question or not. So maybe I'll just let it go at that. Since I moved the mic and so that the viewers online can hear, she said, so then what inspired you to become an artist and go that certain way? Well, I think it goes back to what we talked about before, that we all sort of have that passion and that love exactly. of doing this, that, you know, once you start, you can't but stop. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in the, if you're in the, if you're an illustrator, you know, you are getting a paycheck that is coming in regularly, right. you know, however good or great or bad or whatever it is. <laughs> But when you go out and try to sell your first painting, I mean, I know I do a painting uh, as, as a fun experiment on, you know, on Saturday, and it's a thrill for me to sell it every year. I sell one painting, you know, for a very low end price. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very real thrill. You had, there had to be, there has to be a huge loop of some sort of faith that I'm going to leave this world and do that. What inspired you to sort of make that move? Well, I did it sort of uh, gradually in, in transition. I started doing uh, street fairs and juried exhibits while I was still working as an illustrator. And, you know, even in, you know, the last few years, once in a while, an old client will call and I'll do an illustration job just to, you know, have an extra little bump of cash. But you can you can juggle it a little bit while you're making that transition so it's not such a heart-wrenching decision and when you sort of feel stable then you, you shift right. um, yeah and i think i, I felt more like I, um i said i was an illustrator for 30 years so i came out of art school and i started illustrating right away and when i came out of art school i wasn't very good i mean i was just out of art school but i was good enough to get a couple of commercial jobs and then on and on and on and on but essentially it, it felt like a 30 30, 35 year apprenticeship for me to get better while I was getting paid. So that when I, my end of the illustration business just kind of dried up and went away. They weren't using oil painted book covers anymore. So it just kind of went away. So I almost didn't have a choice, but I had a lot more confidence at that point because I've been painting for so long to start doing this, which I became aware of and thought, oh, that seems like a good idea. So. And, and Tracy, you were saying that you were actually in sculpture and other things like that. You were an artist in kind college, of in yeah. college going through, and you had to actually mature into representative rep representational right. art. Right. 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 Okay, Jess, you have a question? I'm just curious because you were talking about judging before. When you're entering a plein air competition, do you prefer or do you have the, would you prefer the judge to be a professional in the art world? In other words, head of a big museum? Uh, critic, an art critic, someone who's extremely well known, or would you prefer it to be one of your peers who has succeeded? That's well, that, has, that happens. I know it does. That's yeah. why I'm asking. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, it doesn't, I don't think it makes a difference. Again, it's just, you know, I pick the best pictures that I feel like I have to submit, and it doesn't matter to me who the judge is. Yeah. yeah. Although I, I do tend to think that shows are better juried by people who 
are painters or have had some experience as painters. Do you think it's better for a painter to I be I think a they have a better depth yes. of understanding of what yes. they're looking at. Yes. Rather, even from, you know, a museum curator or a gallerist, um, you know, gallery people tend to focus on what's going to sell. That's just their mindset. Um, yeah, I, I think painters I, have a better yeah. feel for what we do. I do feel like the wonkiest, okay, that the discordant, if the disc, the most discordant ju judging from what, as artists, we perceive, it seems like my experience is, is exactly what you're saying, is like that the, that the most discordant are people like that run museums or magazines or something like that, and we're all like, hmm. Um, and then the ones that we feel like, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah, that one, um, usually are the successful painters. Um, as judges, but it's more like that. It's like whoever's the judge is the judge. And we oh, trust right. who as, you bring in. As and nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you just try to pick your and own some, best work. And judging is just weird no matter what, and you just can't invest your ego in it Yeah, as much as we kind of do anyway. We do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, no, we're, we're going to... Yes, we're good. We're going to wrap up here real quick. I'm going to ask well, one more question of you guys. Well, again, we want to thank Rise Up Coffee for being here. They'll be here all weekend. Delicious, beloved Rise Up Coffee from downtown <laughs> Eastern Maryland. We want to thank PNC Wealth Management for underwriting and sponsoring this series. Again, we will have one more of these at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning um, with three other artists who are actually painting Easton right now. And don't forget, at 1 o'clock today, uh, uh, Charlie Hunter and guests will be doing End Train Air. Uh, it's, I'm, it's, it, that's going to be great, a great show to watch. I can tell you, just listening to Charlie Hunter, uh, just watching his comments on Facebook, you can, if you just read those, you'll be like, oh, I want to be there for him live and have him watch him comment on things. So yeah. they, they took a train across, halfway across the country. No pressure, Charlie. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he knows what pressure, pressure is. I don't think he knows what pressure is. Either. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, and then... Um, Real, also, the building that they've been talking about walking into that is so intimidating as artists when they go in there is the Academy Art Museum, and that is Friday night, the uh, judging of the event. There are about 11 tickets left for that show, so if anybody's out there watching and wants to come see what they're talking about, um, because I think all three of you mentioned what an impressive uh, exhibit that is. Uh, real quick, do you guys have any stories of that were kind of like in the field that happened to you that are strange doing plein air painting at all, or, oh. you know, um, Yes. Yes, we all do. <laughs> you have one off the top of your head? Uh, I, you know, probably the train, strangest experience I had was painting in Yellowstone National Park. Um, of course, if you've been there, there's these herds of bison, and there's wildlife, and people driving through the park, they see a bison or a... a bear or whatever, and they will come to a screeching halt and lean out the window and take a picture. So I was painting off the side of the road, and I was actually looking across the road painting, so I was facing, and somebody drove up, came to a screeching halt, and I'm like, turn around thinking something, some large animal is coming out behind me. They lean out the window, take my picture, <laughs> and drive away. <laughs> That's great. That I'm a awesome. buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> nice and wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Paul, I was I was at another plein air event in uh, Wayne in Pennsylvania, and uh, one day I took a drive from there. I took the day off. Took a drive down to um, the Brandywine Museum, where it's all where all the Wyeth uh, family work is. And I wanted to go painting. I'm trying to think of a way to make this a, a very short story. I wanted to go painting over at Kerner's Farm, where Andrew Wyeth did a lot of his paintings. And uh, I drove over there. They told me to go up, knock on the door of this guy around the corner. It was Carl Kerner's grandson, who Carl Kerner was in many of Wyatt's paintings. He said, he's an artist. He'll let you paint there. I went up. I knocked on the door. There was no answer. I saw an old gentleman out in the field cutting down weeds with a, like a scythe almost on the top of the hill. I went over to him. Uh, he introduced himself as Carl Kerner Jr. He, so he's the son of the guy who's in the Wyatt paintings. And he... I told him, I think they get a lot of people down there wanting to know, where's Andy, where's Andy, you know, even though he was dead at that point. And he kind of looked at me like with a, and I said, I'm just an artist, and I was wondering if I could just set up and paint on the hill. 
and he got very friendly and actually walked me up to the top of the hill. And long story short, we were walking along, he was saying something, and he said, oh, watch your step, by the way. This is where we scattered Andy's ashes out of the German. So I'm looking for a humorous sticking up out of the ground as a Wyatt, some part of Andrew Wyatt up there on the hill. So that was one I remember. That's wow. cute. And one of the few paintings, I actually, I never offered that painting for sale. That's one, that one I kept. Aww. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I've done Sedona Plain Air probably about eight or nine years and um, never saw a snake ever. Um, but always aware that they could be around because we get into this like, you know, zone and, and I put on headphones and everything so I couldn't hear a rattle if there was one. Um, so, and I'm dancing oftentimes in the middle of a, of a, of a painting. Um, so anywho's, there was this paint out thing up on Rachel's Knoll, which is kind of like a, an outcropping surrounded by um, um, these beautiful Sedona red rocks, right? And, and it was an event and we were painting out up there and the public was coming through and, and viewing it and everything. And everyone, and so I have only one headphone in, so because if someone comes to talk to me, I can talk to them. Um, so every so often, I would hear this like little faint rustling in the brush, right? And I'm like, oh, that, that was nothing, because I'll look and oh, that was nothing. Um, it was just a bird, because you know the birds are up there, it's happy. Everyone's there's so much traffic coming through. There's people coming through, and well, a snake wouldn't be around here. Come to find out later. Um, there was indeed a bona fide rattlesnake up on Rachel's Knoll while we were painting. In fact, it like one of the artists, it like basically kind of slithered up right next to her. And she like jumped like, like, a, like probably four or five feet, you know, just instinctively. Um, so yeah, there was a rattlesnake at our paint out <laughs> and it did not like not show its face. It showed its face. A rattler. I, yep. A rattler. A rattler. I probably just want to see the paintings like that. I know. It sounds like, he, he sounds like a nice snake, kind of. He didn't bite anybody. So he was just like, I don't want to see. You said the public was invited. <laughs> Once again, uh, this has been Coffee and Conversations. We want to thank Susan Lynn, Trace Fregoli, and Paul Basham for attending as Plein Air Eastern alumni artist. Their work is... Uh, on display all weekend inside the Avalon here, inside the air-conditioned Avalon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to point that out, along with the air-conditioned Art Academy and air-conditioned Ar Armory this weekend. Because <laughs> um, you're going to have to get out. You might as well go in the air-conditioned somewhere and look at some painting. But they will be here all weekend long. They are for sale on display in this ever-changing exhibit inside the Avalon. We want to thank PNC Wealth Management. Thank you guys very much as well. Thank you. Thank Rise Up Coffee, and we will be back here tomorrow. Don't forget Charlie Hunter's in train air at 1 o'clock. Thank you for watching, and if you are an artist or love the art world, there is no question that this is the spot to be on the East Coast this week. We hope to see you out at the festival this weekend. Thank you. Woo